This morning we are in John chapter um, 18. John 18. We're in a passage where we find an arrest happening. But it isn't an ordinary arrest. It's actually a quite bizarre event. First of all, it's 2,000 years ago, and so we don't witness any sirens or squad cars or choppers. There's no guns or tasers or bulletproof vests, so it's different. And even for this time period, this arrest is unusual. What we find is virtually an army of soldiers we going to discover it's almost like 600 soldiers that, armed with every weapon possible, scurrying into the countryside in the dark for a criminal. It has a feel like they're searching for this terrorist that has murdered hundreds or thousands of people, and they're searching for him. And I want, ima- I want you to imagine yourself as a foreigner having the to be in Jerusalem this morning, a pastor buyer who is witnessing this search that's going on um, among these soldiers. And you ask someone local there what's going on, who they're after, who this deadly criminal is. And you find out that this man's name is Jesus. You think, oh, maybe this get her a rough upbringing or that he was raised and hung around with the wrong group of people and that's why they're arresting him. But then you discover as you talk that Jesus was raised in a town called Nazareth by two very loving, God-fearing parents. Maybe you think that he must have been trained in a shady business, but you find out that he's the son of Joseph, a carpenter, and that was what his living was for years. Well, maybe you think, oh, he grew up and he went astray and he got older, but you find out that his vocation was that he was a preacher, an itinerant preacher just teaching the people that came to him. You think maybe he just got caught up in the wrong crowd, bad choice of friends. But then you discover that he has a gang, but not one that would cause you to shrivel or fear, but almost would make you chuckle because of the apparent innocence of all of them. He has some uneducated fisherman, a outcast tax collector, and an insecure man who doubts everything that he hears. And he also has some followers, a posse, if you will. They're mostly women who are viewed as second-class citizens in that day and age. A little short man named Zacchaeus, a closet follower who's a religious leader named Nicodemus, and a young man that you discover in Mark 14 running around wearing only a towel because the soldiers were trying to arrest Jesus, and he runs, and the only thing to cover him was a towel. The moon was full on this dark night in Jerusalem. And finally, you're like, he must have done a horrible, horrible crime, a crime of passion where he got caught up in the moment and he murdered someone. And that's why they're arresting him. But you find out that the reason they're arresting him is that he was out there healing the sick, bringing hope, casting out demons, feeding the poor. Oh, no, yeah, he claims to be God. This is a peculiar arrest For what has Jesus or any of his followers, for that matter, done to be deserving of an arrest by such a large army? They're not a threat to society, or are they? And then the plot thickens as we find this band of soldiers is being led by none other than a friend of Jesus, or a would-be friend of Jesus. His name is Judas, and he leads the lynching, a man who was cared for by Jesus, who had his life saved on the Sea of Galilee by Jesus, who Jesus entrusted with all the money that the disciples received. But now he turns his back on Jesus for financial and political reasons. The sun is setting on Jesus' earthly life. The hour he prayed for has arrived. His death is eminent reality. But as we look at the arrest of Jesus, I want you to learn more from this passage about who this Jesus is that we love, that we worship, that we call our Savior. And I want you to discover some most fascinating and alarming realities of Jesus in the Gospel of John, chapter 18. I want you to discover five things from this text, and we'll read along as we go through these points. Number one, I want you to see the humanity 
of Jesus, the humanity of Jesus. And I forgot to give them the notes this morning, so you're just going to have to listen to me and write them down yourself. Humanity. If you want me to spell them, just raise your hands. I'll (laughs) do that for you as well. The humanity of Jesus. Look at verses 1 and verse 2. After Jesus had said these things, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley where there was a garden, and he and his disciples went into it. Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place because Jesus often met there with his disciples. And so Jesus breaks this prayer huddle in the upper room and journeys with his disciples across the Kidron Rally, right outside the city of Jerusalem, the walls of the city of Jerusalem, about 200 feet near the court of the temple. They enter a garden. And the other disciples, the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, call this garden the Garden of Gethsemane, which means oil press. And the garden was located on the slopes of the Mount of Olives. And there was an olive grove there. And apparently this was a closed area with a gate, which Jesus entered in with his disciples. And John says that his disciples have been there numerous times before. Most likely this walled olive grove was set aside by some wealthy supporter who liked Jesus and was willing to let Jesus used his property whenever he needed. The rich back in those days had private gardens on the Mount of Olives because they couldn't have them in the city because there were ceremonial prohibitions which forbade them from using manure in the city. Maybe Matthew, the disciple, had some connections with a tax collector or Zacchaeus or maybe even Nicodemus. Maybe it was Joseph of Arimathea who lent this garden to Jesus. We don't know for sure who owned the land, but it seems that Jesus would often go to this place, which is why Judas knew that this is where they would find Jesus. But there was something that happens here in the garden that John doesn't record, but it's recorded in the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You see, when Jesus got there, he went back to pray. He was praying in John 17 for the disciples and for you and for I, but then he gets to the garden and he leaves his disciples There, and he goes, and he begins to pray. He takes three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, a little further, and he tells them, hey, would you guys pray with me for a little while? And then Jesus goes a little further into the garden to an olive grove to talk to the Father. He wanted to pray alone, just like he would have to go to the cross alone. And if we were able to see this event, you could almost picture Jesus kind of dragging his feet as he's walking into this garden. He's walking in sorrow, in anguish, barely able to put one foot in front of the other because the weight of what was about to happen to him was overwhelming him. Back in Matthew 4, when he was tempted by Satan in the wilderness, he was tempted for 40 days, and then the angels came and ministered to him. But here in the Garden of Gethsemane, the angels come and minister to him so you can imagine the intensity of what Jesus was going through. One of the Gospels talks about how he had sweats of blood, which is a medical indication that he was severely stressed. He literally falls on his face on the ground multiple times, and he begs the Father in heaven for any other way but the cross. Mark records that he was distressed and troubled, And Jesus kneeled down and he looked up to heaven like he normally would do to see his father. But this time, he found hell and he staggered. You see, most likely during this prayer, Jesus probably didn't hear much from the father. The cosmic abandonment has begun because he would bear the penalty of our sin and our penalty. And after this sorrow, he returns to his disciples to see them sleeping. They weren't able to stay awake with him. And for three times, he wakens them up, and the disciples have no idea what to think at this moment. Jesus was acting incredibly peculiar and abnormal, not to mention the blood that he was constantly having to wipe off of his brow. They thought that he was praying, but he looked like he had just fought a wild animal in the garden. They know it had come to this place many times to pray before, but they've never seen him act or look like this. All the other times when he was in communion with the Father, he would come back with joy and happiness, returning with a smile on his face after spending time with the Father. But Jesus wasn't smiling this time. Lines appeared on his face from the tears 
that were streaming down his face, washing away the dirt where he had been kneeling on the ground. His heart is pounding a mile a minute, and his head is slouched like a sunflower in full bloom. It seems like he is carrying something on his back the way he was just dragging his feet, but nothing could be seen. And here we see the humanity of Jesus. That he was a man, 100%, while still being God, 100%. Listen, Jesus wasn't pulling a fast one on anyone, acting as if he was a human, but really in reality that he was strong and powerful. Jesus was human. He was smothered by the mere whiff of what he was about to go through on the cross. Of course, Jesus knew that he was going to die and repeatedly told his disciples that he was going to die. But now he is beginning to taste and he will experience the cross in just a few hours. And it goes far beyond physical torture and physical death. What was this terrible thing? It was the very heart of the prayer of Jesus. Father, take this cup from me. Take this cup from me. Jesus knew what was about to occur and the thought of the cross becoming sin for us and having the Father turn his back on him. And that broke his heart. That devastated him. That caused him to weep in anguish. Friends, as you fight through suffering, as you endure heartache, as you go through trials, as you are surrounded by pain and loss in your life, know that Jesus has been there. Know that Jesus has gone before you. One of the greatest elements of the incarnation is that God became human and lived our life. He is not some smoldering, pent-up with anger deity that's just blasting out commands for his people to obey without having any idea what it's like to live under the weight. He went under the weight, the weight of what you feel. He lived the life of a human, and get this, he lived it to perfection. And even though it was hard, hard, he was never defeated. He never raised a white flag. He never threw in the towel. Jesus was hungry, thirsty, poor, no place to sleep, rejected by friends, confused by family, slandered, mocked, criticized, unappreciated. He had a father who died at a young age. He had friends die around him. He had siblings that didn't like him. He had people that disowned him, a community that rejected him, religious leaders that tried to kill him. He was accused of not caring. He was accused of being lazy. Some would call him an illegitimate child of Mary. Finally, he was beaten, robbed, condemned, lynched by an angry mob. But friends, not for a moment did he quit on you. Not for a moment did he give up on you. I love the song we sang as we closed in worship this morning. He will never let go. He'll never give up on us. But he did wrestle with it. But see, unlike you and I, Jesus didn't seek to change the circumstance or see his circumstances as negotiable, which is what many times you and I do when we go through suffering and hardships and difficulties. But here is Jesus in the garden is not taking the way of detachment and isolation. He's pouring his heart out to the Father. He's undone, he's, but he's not taking circumstances into his own hands. In the end, he's obeying relinquishing control over his circumstances and submitting his own desires to the will of the Father. And he would pray, Father, take this cup from me nevertheless. Not my will, but your will. Jesus wasn't suppressing his desires to be spared from the suffering, but he, was going and he, but he wasn't going to surrender to them either. He trusted. He obeyed God. 
He put himself into the hands of God, and then he went forward. Jesus doesn't deny his emotions, but he doesn't avoid the suffering. He loves even in the midst of suffering. In the midst of his suffering, he obeys for the love of the Father and for the love of you and I. This is why the writer of Hebrews would say that Jesus endured for the joy that was set before him. This is why you can he now hear him say in heaven that you can bring anything to him and lay everything in front of him because he understands, because he knows, because he cares. Friends, there is not a thing that you can lay on him that he cannot both relate to and that he cannot avoid. The writer of Hebrews says it this way in Hebrews 2. He says, therefore, he had been made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of his people because he himself was suffered when tempted. He is able to keep those who are being tempted. There's an old hymn that we used to sing growing up. And I think we've sung it here before. It's called, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Listen to these lines again and meditate on the fact that Jesus can hear you and that he can hold you. What a friend we have in Jesus. All of our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege it is that we can carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit, we neglect. What needless pain we bear. Why? Because we do not carry everything to him in prayer. You have trials. You have temptation. Is there trouble anywhere? You should never be discouraged. Why? You can take it to the Lord in prayer. Can you find a friend so faithful who all our sorrows will share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Friends, take it to the Lord in prayer. Are you weak? Are you heavy laden? Are you burdened with the load of care? Precious Savior, he's still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do your friends despise you, forsake you, reject you? Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms, he'll take and shield you. Take it to the Lord in prayer. I love the last stanza. It says, Blessed Savior, thou hast promised that you will all our burdens bear. May we ever, Lord, be bringing everything to you in earnest prayer. Soon, in glory bright unclouded, there will be no need for prayer. Rapture, praise, and unending worship will be our sweet portion there. What are you carrying? What weight are you bearing? What burden are you putting on yourself that you feel like you have to do it by yourself. Do you understand that you have a Savior who's not only gone through everything that you have gone through, experienced suffering and anguish and pain, but he's gone through so much worse. And he now intercedes for you. And he loves you. He hears you. And he holds you in the palm of his hands. Number one, we see the humanity of Jesus. Number two, we see the deity of Jesus, the deity of Jesus. Verse, look at verse 3. So Jesus took a company of soldiers, some officials from the chief priests, and the Pharisees, and he came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. The language tells us that this was a Roman army with over 600 soldiers. Listen, these aren't bodyguards at a Justin Bieber concert trying to keep teenage girls away from Justin Bieber. This is not what's going on here. This is a blend of ultimate fighter and Spartan with a dash of gladiator topped with the winner of 
America's Strongest Man contest. This is who's coming after Jesus. Historically, there were plenty of troops available at this moment because the Passover was approaching. And in years past, there has been uprisings and upheavals during this time. So the Roman government would send more soldiers to Jerusalem during this time of the year. And after, and they're after an innocent Galilean peasant carpenter that's turned into a preacher. I can understand the lanterns and I can understand the torches because it's nighttime and there's no street lights. What about all these weapons that they're carrying? When was Jesus ever mentioned carrying weapons or starting fights? Why are they armed and why are they so many? See, these soldiers know that there is more to Jesus than meets the eye. They know there is more to him than just simply a peasant. So they come armed to the T, not knowing what's going to happen, hoping for the best but preparing for the worst. They don't know what to think of Jesus because by all appearances, he just seems to be a a nuisance to them. But he's more like a threat of a lion. But they, no doubt, they're afraid. So much so that they wouldn't even admit it to themselves. They've tried to arrest Jesus before on numerous occasions, but he's always escaped them. They've sent temple guards to arrest Jesus, and the temple guards come back and say, We can't arrest him. There's no one else like him. They doubt, they no doubt thought that he was unarrestable. And so they beefed up the troops and they packed everything they could in the hopes that this would be the time they catch Jesus. And this is why they needed Judas. Judas provided them a unique opportunity and information that made them think that this is the time it's going to happen. No doubt Judas had told them that Jesus had been talking about his death and that his death was imminent. There has been a three-hour gap between the time that Jesus sent Judas off from the upper room to this moment. And in those three hours, they had to figure out if they had enough men, if the leadership would cooperate. It was a kangaroo court, and the trial was whisked by an alarming rate because Passover was soon approaching. Go to verse 4. Then Jesus, knowing everything that was about to happen to him, went and said to them, Who is it that you are seeking? See, John the writer of this gospel wants us to know, wants us to be sure that Jesus knew what was about to happen. That Jesus knew every little detail of what was about to go on. That he is, none of this is catching him surprised, that he is sovereign over it. You saw him do this in John 13 as well. John's gospel lifts the veil of deity so that we get glimpses of Jesus as God. Remember that Jesus said that before that no one can take his life, so he voluntarily lays it down. And so Jesus would go out and meet this band of soldiers and surrender himself voluntarily. They thought they were approaching Jesus, but here is Jesus boldly approaching them. And now back in the garden account in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, the idea of the language is that Jesus basically says, you know what, guys, let's take this outside. And they went outside the park area, outside the gate, and they shut the gate. And the disciples now are no doubt awake and afraid, and they're leaning over the fence to find out what's going on. And they're probably waking up to a startling scene with torches and lights and hearing all of this commotion. Verse 5. They answered Jesus of Nazareth. I am he, Jesus told them. Judas, who betrayed him, was also standing with him. The literal translation of this verse is not I am he, it's I am. I am. Like Moses at the burning bush and Jesus in John 8, when they asked, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, he says, I am. See, we always use the verb to be with an object. We say, I am this, or I am that, or I am because of this. But Jesus is not dependent on anything or anyone. Everyone else depends on him because he is just, I am. Jesus is saying something that no one else has ever said. As a matter of fact, it is the exact opposite of every other religion that's out there. Every other founder of a religion is a prophet that is pointing to a truth or a way to live. But Jesus has the audacity to say, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. 
No, we have a real problem in our culture when it comes to spirituality. People like to think of, some, of themselves as spiritual people. They, find, they say that what fits your need best, go out and do it. But mix and, mix and match what you want to. But listen, Jesus doesn't allow you to go to Costco for spirituality. Jesus says that he is superior to every other religion that's out there. He outdoes everyone. He trumps everyone. And it is all on his terms, not on our terms. Christianity can't sit on a shelf with any other religion. It is either superior or it is stupid. It is absolutely superior to every other religion or it's stupid compared to every other religion. You can't like Jesus and embrace Christianity as superior and the exclusivity of the cross. Otherwise, you're committing intellectual suicide. You either need to bow to him as Lord or run away from him in fear and join the mob of humanity that wants to kill him. See, if you think our president is a polarizing figure, he doesn't hold a candle to Jesus. Look at verse 6. Jesus said to him, when Jesus told him, I am, they stepped back and fell to the ground. And he asked them again, who is it that you're seeking? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. I love this. When I first read this a couple of weeks ago, reading this passage, some of you get this. I was like, oh, man, Jesus just went Benny Hinn on these guys. It was like, Psh! And they just knocked out, right? Some of you know what I'm saying. Some of you have no idea what I'm saying. And if you don't know what I'm saying, don't look it up. It is worse than the Momo challenge. Do not look it up, right? And we see in verses 2 and 3 that these guys, this troop of 600 soldiers, they just fall flat, fall flat on their backs when Jesus says, I am. And here is this homeless peasant guy with no crowd or more with him, and they all, no crowd with him, and there's more that's against him, and they all flat, fall flat on their backs, losing their footings on the hillside. It's simply the words of Jesus. And so they gather themselves, they try to get back up. And I can just picture Jesus with a little smirk on his face, like, okay, let me ask you again. Who are you looking for? And this time I can see the soldiers like holding onto a tree or digging their foot in the ground because they don't want to fall again, right? And so they say, It's Jesus. What made them react like that? See, the only explanation is in that moment they saw a sliver of God's glory pulsating from the lips of Jesus, and they can't keep their footing. They fall in awe because they're in the midst of God. They're standing in the presence of God. And friends, this poses a serious problem, not just for those guys, but it poses a problem for us because none of us can stand in the presence of God's glory. We will all fall down and lose our footing. John, who is writing this gospel, knows all about this. Throughout the earthly life of Jesus, we find John as the disciple that Jesus loved, part of the inner circle, ever leaning back to talk to Jesus in the upper room. But in Revelation, when John sees Jesus for the first time glorified some 60 years later, here's what John says, that when I saw him, I fell at his feet as if I was dead. See, this hits home because you all know you can't stand before his glory or keep your footing. You can't even stand before your own critics. Francis Schaeffer once talked about having a tape recorder that would record all the standards that you held for other people. All the times you said, oh, what they're doing is wrong or what they're doing is not right or how could they do that? And then he said, imagine one day you're standing before God and God would play back all the judgments you made of other people and then showing you your own life. You wouldn't be able to live up to your own standards. Much less would you be able to live up to the standards of God. And John wants us to know here that Jesus is God, that he is absolutely sovereign over this whole situation. He is not some impotent being who is a victim of men and soldiers. He is in charge of the entire production, the entire scene. He has orchestrated every single detail. He approaches them before they ever approach him. 
See, this is a sharp contrast from what you see from a few verses ago where Jesus is praying in the garden with blood dripping from his forehead to now he is standing in front of these soldiers who have weapons and is ready to arrest him. And he stands boldly before him and he says, I am. And these 600 soldiers go tumbling down the hillside with now blood all over their foreheads. And they're in anguish. Think about the gospel story, friends. We find Jesus born as a helpless baby, and yet wealthy, prestigious men would come and bow before him. We find him following poor peasant parents to the temple at the age of 12, and yet grown, educated men are sitting at his feet and learning by the time he leaves. We find him exhausted and knocked out in the back of a boat and a massive storm in the middle of the sea and the disciples awaken him and he gets up and the winds and the seas, they obey him. We find him weeping at the grave of Lazarus, his friend, and yet a word from his mouth brings this dead man back alive. This is our amazing God, friends. This is the Jesus that you and I worship. This is the Jesus that has died for our sins. This is the Jesus that was resurrected so that you and I can say, Abba, Father. This is Jesus. He not only knows what you go through and experiences what you go through, but he controls what you go through and he loves you no matter what you go through. The deity of Jesus. Number three, the security of Jesus. The security of Jesus. We find again how Jesus keeps his own. Eternal security seems to be in like every chapter of this gospel. Look at verse eight. I told you I am he. So if you're looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the words he said, I have not lost one of those that you have given me. I can imagine the disciples now are like peeking over the fence, having witnessed this mass army fall in the ground in the presence of Jesus. And now all of a sudden there's courage rising up for them, right? They're now pounding their fists like, oh, Jesus could take out 600 people in one second. We could take over Israel in a heartbeat. Their wildest dreams are about to come true. Jesus is about to open up a can on the Romans, for better uh, words. But their expression no doubt changes to confusion and disappointment when they hear Jesus, when they hear these words from Jesus saying, hey, let my friends go. Let these men go. You can picture Nathaniel saying, man, I thought he was just about to let them have it. James is like, I don't want to go anywhere. I want to see you call fire down and destroy these guys. But no doubt the disciples notice Jesus now putting up his arms in surrender. And they're dumbfounded. They're confused. What was excitement just a few seconds ago now is confusion. And now confusion has turned to fear. The disciples were now in mortal danger. A tax collector, a few fishermen, a former enemy of the state, and versus 600 Roman soldiers protocol was that if you were arresting an insurrectionist, you also arrest his followers. And no doubt, they jumped over the fence on the backside of the garden, and they went running into the darkness for their lives, all except Peter. But notice, Jesus said that all this happened so that he could prove that he would keep them. What does that mean? How is that the case? Two reasons how this protected them. One is that they're not arrested, to which they would have been tried and killed as well. Second, Jesus protected them by taking their place. Think about it. Jesus was the only innocent man in the entire scene, and yet he is the only one who was arrested and eventually killed. Once he was dead, the, arrest, the authorities didn't care about his followers. And the phrase there, let these men go in Greek, is basically forgive these men. Let them go. Don't hold it against them. In other words, take me instead of them. Meaning, these men broke the law. These men deserve death, but take me instead. These men violated every command. These men deserve to die, but take me instead. He takes the penalty for us by taking our place in our stead and thus appeasing the wrath of God for us. 
in the film, The Last of the Mohicans, there's a man, there's two, three characters, one by the name of Duncan, who is a British officer, Hawkeye, and then a lady by the name of Cora. These two men love Cora, and they hate each other. They're not friends with each other. Cora rejects Duncan for Hawkeye and loves Hawkeye. And one day, all three of these men are captured by in the middle of the French and Indian War. And the chief says, Cora must die because of the sins of her family. Hawkeye and Duncan, you're free to go. Hawkeye, the one who is rejected, gets upset and says, take me. Me for her. Trade me for her. And Duncan turns around and says in French for him, saying, hey, take Hawkeye. Hawkeye will die. And the chief, the chief then takes Duncan, and he gives Cora to Hawkeye, and Duncan burns at the stake. Duncan loves someone who didn't love him back. Friends, this is what Jesus did for you and I. He said, this is for Sam. This is for Nick. This is for Angelica. This is for John, a.k.a. Anna. This is for... Shannon, this is for Paul. He keeps his own. Even, not because we deserve it, not because we love him, but simply because he loves us. Because he loves us. Even when we rejected him, he was willing to die for us. Number five, number four, the patience of Jesus. I want you to see the patience of Jesus. Look at verse 10. Simon Peter, who had his sword, drew it, struck the high priest's servant, and cut off his right ear. And the servant's name was Malchus. Peter, all of a sudden, realizes that they're actually going to take Jesus. And so he tries to be true to their promise that he will never abandon Jesus, even if the others do. And he begins to go and fight 600 men. He breaks out the door and he leads this charge against 600 men and the sword basically touches the ear of one of the servants, not even a soldier. But Peter was just a fisherman, not a soldier. And all it does is stabs a ear, strikes one servant. Malchus, and no doubt he puts his hand to his head and he's looking at his hand dripping with blood and you hear the sound of a hundred soldiers pulling out their weapons to attack Peter. And the other gospel tells us that Jesus took the ear of this servant and put it back on Malchus's head and healed him. And you could hear whispers rippling through the crowd. Jesus tells Peter, put away the sword, stop fighting. Think about Peter for a second. Three years, hands-on training with Jesus. And this is the key moment after Jesus told them over and over that he was going to die so you don't have to fight. And I think it's amazing that Jesus doesn't tell the soldiers, hey, you know what, I changed my mind. You can kill this guy. He's, he doesn't listen. He doesn't say that. He turns to Peter and says, you know, Peter, one more time. I need to die for you. I need to take your place. The cross, the death, resurrection is all in my plan. Put away your sword. But notice Jesus doesn't rebuke Peter. He doesn't make fun of Peter. He doesn't even turn on Peter, even though all of that would have been justified. Think about this fisherman carrying a sword to attack 600 soldiers. What an idiot. Jesus shows mercy and grace and patience with Peter along with Malchus, just because he will take this man and heal his ears. And all the while, they're arresting him. First Corinthians 13, you know this passage. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not boast. It is not arrogant. It is not rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable. It is not resentful. It doesn't rejoice at wrongdoing. It rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Jesus loved Peter. He loved Peter from the moment he saw him 
He loved Peter through every failure that he went through. He loved Peter through every disappointment that Peter brought into Jesus' life. Jesus loved Peter not because of Peter. Jesus loved Peter despite of Peter. Aren't you glad that Jesus does not give up on us? How many times have we thought that, man, I've probably failed. I've done one too many sins. God is done with me. And yet scripture continues to remind us love never quits. Jesus never gives up. He never gives up. He never lets us go. He never says, that's one too many. He loves you. He keeps pursuing you. He is patient with you. Friends, this should affect you deep down to the core. It should affect the way you live. And can I also say it should affect the way you deal with other people because some of us are impatient with other people. Some of us, it could be due to our arrogance. We want our way and we want our way right now. And we tend to make excuses like we're in a hurry when Jesus here is demonstrating patience before he dies on a cross. You and I, we are Peter, and we want to move ahead with our agenda, but Jesus doesn't turn on us. Instead, he dies for us. Last point, don't you see the tenacity of Jesus? The tenacity of Jesus. Verse 11, at that, Jesus said to Peter, put your sword away. Am I not to drink the cup the Father has given me? Despite the rejection of the world, the rejection of his family, the rejection of his own disciples, Jesus remains tenacious. He remains resolute on going to the cross for you and I. You see, Jesus told Peter to put away the sword because Jesus would eventually fall on the sword for Peter and for us. This is why Jesus here talks about drinking from a cup. You know, there's two cups that are mentioned in Scripture. There's a cup of salvation, and there's a cup of wrath. Every one of us will have to drink from one of these cups. If you reject Jesus, you will eventually drink from the cup of wrath for eternity. If you know Jesus, you will drink from the cup of salvation. But the only reason you can drink from the cup of salvation is because Jesus drank from the cup of wrath for you and I. This cup is what Jesus prayed about in the Garden of Gethsemane. This is the cup that he said, Father, take this cup away from me. But he resolved to drink every last drip, every last drop of this cup for you and I who would believe in Jesus. This is why Paul would say in Romans 8, Thou there is therefore no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. Knowing that on judgment day, your sins have already been judged for by Jesus gives you stability and confidence and assurance today. That means not only will you be able to stand before the glory of Jesus when you die and revel in it instead of cowering away, but now you can stand in the face of people who mock you for your faith, who reject you for your faith, who don't understand why you follow Jesus. Some of us are so crippled by what other people think of us that we forget what God the Father thinks about us, that we are loved, that we are called, that we are his, that we are his sons and daughters, which is a surpassing value to what anyone else would say about you. As a son and daughter of God, that justice will be served one day. Every one of us will stand before the judge. All injustices will be made right. All criticisms of you will drop to the floor as meaningless when you see the glory of God in through Jesus shine in full force. It won't matter what other people say. It won't matter what other people think. It won't matter what other people do. And that future promise will help strengthen you today to be able to stand firm for Jesus. As we go to communion... I want you to consider Jesus' journey to Jerusalem from the garden. Verse 1 says that he passed 
through this place called the Kidron Valley. No doubt when he and the soldiers are arresting him, they go past the same valley again called the Kidron Valley. The Passover is at hand. And history tells us that during the Passover, over 250,000 lambs were slain in Jerusalem for the Passover festivities. And since the Passover was occurring the next day, the lines of people at the temple getting their lambs slain was immense. It was such a bloody mess that the temple had a channel that was cut from the altar that drained the blood away from the temple down into a valley called the Kidron Valley. And no doubt as Jesus was being led to the temple area, he would have observed the blood that was flowing down the hillside into the valley, but he probably also walked right through it. The inevitable was about to happen His blood was about to be spilled and run down the hill of Calvary for the sins of all humanity. As John the Baptist would say, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Would you take time to reflect on that Jesus? If you need prayer this morning, Andrew and Lauren are available in the back if you want someone to pray with you. It could be something related to what the Spirit of the Lord is saying speaking to you this morning from this sermon, or maybe you've been struggling with your walk with Jesus and you just want someone to just pray and encourage you and pour into you. Maybe you're not a follower of Jesus and you want someone to talk to you more about Jesus. Maybe you have a rough week or you have something going on in your life and you just would love someone to pray with you. Andrew, Lauren are back there. Would you go visit with them? If you need that, they're available. Go pray with them before coming, grabbing the elements from the table this morning. Would you take time to reflect on one of these attributes of Jesus? His humanity, his deity, his security, his patience, his tenacity. Reflect on how that can direct and guide your life. When you're ready as a Christian, come forward. Take the bread and juice as a means of remembering the body and the blood. Our Father, we pause. We pause and simply to say thank you. Thank you for Jesus. We thank you that in Jesus we have someone that understands every struggle, every temptation, every hardship that we face in life. So that when we bring our needs to you, not only are you able to understand, but you're also able to bear it. We thank you that Jesus is in control of the drama called our life. And there's not a thing that happens to us that catches you by surprise. But that you are in absolute control of our lives. We thank you that because you keep your own, not because we deserve it. Not because we're so in love with you, but because you love us. Father, I don't know about anyone else in this room, but I am grateful that you are patient. That you're patient with me. Slow to anger. Not treating me the way I deserve. Father, I'm in awe that you would treat Jesus the way I should have been treated. But this morning, we're treated the way Jesus should have been treated. Father, would you give us that same patience with those around us? We thank you, Father, knowing how capable we are of committing the most awful, awful sins that lie beneath the surface of our hearts and that apart from your grace and your mercy, and your sovereign control, and that's what we see in the life of Peter. You prayed for him, and you never gave up on Peter. And we ask Jesus, pray for us. Intercede for us, great high priest on the throne of heaven, that we would bring great joy to you. As we come to the table this morning, remind us of what Jesus went through so that we could be here this morning. And may we come with humility, with awe, 
with wonder, with worship. Minister to us as we celebrate this table that you've set before us. In Jesus' name.